momentary pause while I wait to come on. So anyway, um, anyway I'm Cassandra French, and um, I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, a little bit daunted, because it's an amazing lineup of speakers, and um, to be following David, bad slot. <laughs> so uh, forgive me, it won't be anywhere near as engaging, but uh, that's why we're working with David, right? Um, <laughs> hooray. Um, I'm also wearing two hats. Um, as the former project manager for natural childhood at the National Trust, and as I stand before you today as part of the Wild Network, along with the Nat uh, National Trust and others. Um, so what I want to tell you about really is the journey that I and the National Trust have been on. It's been quite a journey, uh, and it's culminated in a, a fantastic opportunity to bring organizations uh, that believe in something and want to uh, come together around a cause and filmmakers and how you put those two together in an emerging discipline uh, and reach new audiences in a different way. So I will start at the beginning um, and that was back in uh, 2010 when the National Trust ran its Outdoor Nation project and that saw roaming reporter Lenny in a VW camper van driving around the UK asking if as a nation we're losing touch with the outdoors and if we are does it matter? Um, Unsurprisingly, the resounding answer to both of those was yes, um, and that got the trust thinking, really. Um, why were they looking into this issue, and particularly children's disconnection with nature? Well, because people won't protect what they don't care about, and people won't care about something they don't experience. So, um, from a very basic level for the trust, there are cause set up to protect special places forever for everyone. Problem. So, um, what we established from the Outdoor Nation report was that, um, was that the why and what to do about this issue was kind of complex. And uh, as Wendy said, we commissioned Stephen Moss, uh, writer and producer, broadcaster, the brain behind Spring Watch. He spent many years at uh, the BBC's Natural History Unit um, to write uh, the Natural Childhood Report, which brought together all the research uh, and current thinking in the issue. And it was really a piece of journalism, I suppose, to prompt debate. Uh, and as a consequence, it was launched as a, a consultation. And we asked people uh, four questions. What are the barriers? What can individuals and families do? What can organizations and communities do? And what can policymakers and leaders do? And we were really pleasantly surprised by the number of uh, responses we got, more than 200 responses. Um, and a lot of this, I'm going to kind of whistle through it because I, I'm conscious of time and also because it's the past and let's not dwell there. So these were the barriers, um, unreasonable health and safety culture, traffic dangers, I know Tim spoke about um, risk and health and safety yesterday, traffic dangers, the rise of indoor entertainment, uh, finding time and space for nature in schools and learning, um, receding access to quality green space. Um, I can't say it better than Mason, so I won't. Um, and socioeconomic and cultural factors, which were just, you know, wide and varied. Um, and interestingly, whilst we knew that urban um, children were probably suffering from a lack of space, rural kids uh, were suffering from not being able to get to, to good, safe, quality spaces because of farmland, because of roads, because no pavements, etc. So really complex issues. But we were focusing on solutions, not just the status quo. So these were the three main solutions that came out for individuals and families. And simple, free experiences of the outdoors can slot into family routine. The idea being that this isn't um, an add-on, uh, it's not difficult, it should be as simple and easy as possible to fit it into your day-to-day -day life and it's commonplace. Networks of family and friends are underused, so if you as a parent don't have a lot of confidence talking about you know, nature and wildlife and getting your kids inspired, look around you, who is around you, who are your local nature heroes, how can they help you to do that? Um, and that parents can draw on the support of local community groups and national organisations, this is just a, a really high level selection, but you know, there are lots of great initiatives out there, so how do we get parents using those and how do we expand their reach so they can help more people. Community groups, local, national organisations. Big learning point, I suppose. 
Partnership working between NGOs, community groups, and schools is critical. Basically, we were being told, you're not doing enough in a joined up way. You need to be playing better with others, okay? Schools can do a lot for themselves, um, and you know, forest schools is a fantastic example um, of something that's working. Akin to kind of uh, number one, information and opportunities for families is completely disjointed. So you can't, as a parent, just go to one place and say, hmm, what can I do today? I've got 10 minutes, like the Wild Time app. What can I do? Where can I go? You have to go to a myriad of different places and probably don't find everything that's out there anyway. Um, and that nature organizations need to be more proactive in promoting what they do. So it's no good setting up your stall and saying, come to a National Trust property and do X, Y, and Z. They need to be working more in the community and taking this knowledge and, you know, the benefits of it all to, to people where they are. So on to leaders and policy makers, what are the solutions here? Well, continue to improve access to quality green spaces. Uh, education needs space for nature. Um, the National Union of Teachers actually sent us a really comprehensive consultation response, uh, and, and that was the kind of thing they were saying. Um, clearer health and safety guidance, but more critically, a complete cultural shift to benefit risk assessment. Instead of constantly looking at what's the risk of doing this, we should be looking at what's the benefit to it too. Um, streets, make them safer for outdoor play. Um, living streets, playing out, done some amazing things um, in, for, for themselves initially and then trying to help other groups to do the same. But it could still be easier and leaders and policy makers need to be playing a role in that. Uh, and finally, grassroots initiatives need continued support. Um, the play sector has had massive cuts and that will have a huge impact. Our, our leaders need to be consistent about the support that they're giving to initiatives that really work. So, taking all of that together, um, there seem to be four kind of dimensions uh, and tasks that seem sensible. So, one with education and learning, one around nature spaces, so not just protecting them, making sure there are more of them, but better connecting them. Um, risk and fear, you know, rapidly adopt this benefit-risk approach and help facilitate nature and the outdoors being part of family life. But uh, the National Trust felt that uh, it wasn't enough just to take these consultation responses and they wanted some further verification. So we spoke to some parents and we spoke to some kids. Seemed like a sensible thing to do. Um, and the top four reasons that parents think it's hard for kids to get outside to speak for themselves. Um, interestingly, parents and kids were very lined up on what, what they needed to be encouraged uh, to spend more time out. Safe places, Areas where they were supervised and activities, and the kids were pretty much mirroring that. Uh, and these were the kind of things that they wanted to do. Um, you'll see the similarity to the, the trust 50 things to do before you're 11 and three quarters. Uh, so what we did kind of learn from the research with the children is that there were three main elements to getting um, them spending time outdoors and in nature, and these were the important things to them. It was time, so whether it's an everyday routine or days out, snow days, loads of them talked about snow days because it was a time when families were together and everything else was deprioritized. It was just about getting out and having fun with your family. Um, place really didn't matter, could be anywhere, garden, street, park, just matter that there was somewhere that they knew they could go. And really importantly, company, and I, I don't think we'd kind of appreciated how important it was for children that an aspect of this was who they were doing it with. It was time for spending time with their friends or their families or their siblings. And there was one heartbreaking story from a, a little boy who used to play out all the time with his best mate, um, and he fell out with his best mate, and his mum then wouldn't let him go out. Um, you know, so company and that element was really, really critical. Um, that's a whistle-stop tour, uh, so you can find a lot more in the, the Reconnecting Children with Nature, which is the kind of follow-up to uh, natural childhood. This is the, basically the consultation responses and, and sense-making of that. So, um, with all of those barriers and all of those solutions, it seemed clear to the Trust that they couldn't do that on their own, and um, they ran the Natural Childhood uh, Summit, and that brought together more than 50 organisations 
Um, we kind of replayed some of the, the issues. We had some great speakers from Chris Packham, Michael DePledge, Tim Gill, um, Juno Hollyhock. So we kind of looked at that. We looked at the consultation responses. And then we workshopped around what those solutions might actually look like on the ground. What are the practical applications? And uh, these are just uh, some of the examples. So wild space amnesty. Why don't communities claim back the spaces that aren't being used for anything else? Or nature games, you know, picking up on this, um, this idea of working in partnership. Could you have an extended period of time where wherever you went, you could do something? Um, to kind of more commercial scale, say nature vouchers and, and nature ices, dare I say it. Um, so that was kind of one stream of activity. And at the same time as, as doing all this kind of research and, and consultation, um, the trust approached industry leaders, BritDoc, uh, who essentially bring together filmmakers and organizations um, that want to work on the same issue. And through them, um, we, were, we found our kind of original group of partners, Arla and uh, NHS Sustainable Development Unit, and um, the wonderful Green Lions, uh, and decided to work together um, on a film, which turned out to be Project Wild Thing. Um, and I think at this point, I should say what's really important about the relationship is that um, David's film is entirely editorially independent. So those organizations wanted uh, an engagement tool and wanted someone to make a film about this issue and uh, put money into that. Um, but David was allowed to do whatever he wanted in terms of making the best possible film and exploring the issues. So, um, yeah, and I'm just going to take the, the opportunity to thank David and the Green Lions team for making such a beautiful, inspirational, and intelligent film about a really complex issue. And you've done all of us and yourselves very, very proud. And I'm sure that you'll all think that when you see it too. So thank you. Why film? Uh, I'm going to do my little channel Brit doc, or try to. So film, the reason we chose to use a film was because um, essentially it, it is a tool for maturing the issue in the public's consciousness and other groups' consciousness. Um, it provides a great platform for influencing and uh, as aptly demonstrated by David and then myself having to follow him, there is nothing quite like a film for humanizing uh, and um, emotionally connecting someone to an issue. Um, and the way that this kind of film campaign uh, you know, relationship works is that the campaign uh, wins resources, partners reach through the film and then supports the film and gives it more of a platform. So this takes us kind of to the end of uh, September. Seems like a lifetime ago. And this was kind of what we wanted to do. So we knew we had the beginnings of a partnership with lots of great organizations saying, yeah, we want in, let us know what we're, you know, what's the plan. Um, we ran a crowdfunding campaign and I know that there's quite a few people in this room that contributed to that. So thank you very much. Uh, it was really, really appreciated. Um, so we continued to kind of fundraise for the film. Um, and then we started thinking about um, options for the campaign, taking into consideration everything that we've been told, um, with a, an eye to launching off the back of the Sheffield Documentary Festival in June. So that's the past. Uh, and as I stand here today, as part of the Wild Network, I'm really pleased to say that it is launching with its own identity. And we are the Wild Network. Um, what is the Wild Network? Well, perhaps I should start with the name. Why wild? Wild because this is more than nature. It's, it's more than outdoors. It's something that's inherent in all of us. Um, why network? Because that's what we are. We are open, collaborative, participative. And um, that's what we want to continue to be. So currently, um, we would say we're a groundbreaking partnership because of the diversity, I suppose, of people and because we're using film, uh, which is an emerging discipline to kind of do this kind of thing. So um, these are our current uh, founding group. Um, and I'd kind of like to impress on you all that the founding group is really the governance body and the kind of business bit of the network. Um, 
We are in the process of setting up an advisory group um, which will essentially direct and steer the work of the network. We're also looking to grow our partners um, and by being a partner or a supporter, essentially you're lending your support to the work of the network and in return getting access to channels, collateral, the film, etc. And um, it is absolutely intended to be looking at a campaign and ways to build a movement that um, are more than the sum of their parts and um, amplify, not compete with what's already going on out there. So there's some fantastic stuff and what we hope is that this is a way to magnify that. Um, we've also got a purpose. Uh, broadly speaking, it's this. It's to highlight the problem and consequences of children's disconnection from nature. Uh, it's to identify the barriers and agree policy objectives to remove them. And it is to showcase the opportunities to engage with children's, children with nature through projects, events, and locations. And this is kind of our update of where we are right now. We're really, really thrilled to have been awarded £60,000 by the Esme Fairburn Foundation. Um, and they gave us that money to develop the creative and strategy for the campaign and the movement. Um, and as a consequence, we've been able to appoint Swarm as our consultancy. Swarm are, in fact, good for nothing that you saw in David's presentation. Uh, this is their kind of day job. And they are experts in working collaboratively, which is why we chose to work with them. Um, I'm thrilled and uh, honoured to have been appointed the campaign and partnership manager for the Wild Network. Um, and we are busy developing brand, comm strategy, a platform uh, to make this whole kind of grouping work, a fundraising model, and look at some ways of measuring. Film, I won't repeat what David said, but we uh, have a rough cut that's completed, and it's awesome. Um, we've been accepted to the Sheffield Documentary Festival, which is just brilliant, and uh, we've held a test screening, including at the, the National Trust, and we hope to hold one with the advisory group in May. So um, that's kind of given us a really good sense of what people watching the film think the themes are and what the takeaway message is. Um, and looking to the future, our first project will be Project Wild Thing. So what are the next steps? Well, we need to confirm the brand expression and we need to work with AMV and all the members of that partnership to kind of figure out how it's going to sit all together. So what does being part of the Wild Network mean? How does it live in the real world? How does it uh, amplify, not compete with what's already going on? Um, we need to look at the film's ask and broadly speaking, what, we, what we've established from the screenings is that the ask from the film is going to be to spend less time on screens and more time, wild time, basically. Um, and we need to, to, our role in that is to make that as easy, simple as possible to, to facilitate it, basically. And we want to do that through partners, but also through technology. So I, again, I kind of say the Wild Network and the movement is not anti-technology, but we think that the balance is wrong and we think that technology needs to facilitate other forms of activity. Um, we're kind of going for a high-tech, high-nature hybrid. <laughs> Let you know how that goes. Um, fundraising, it's always there. We're doing it, we need to do more of it. Um, and then getting the film to audiences, which is really, really crucial. Who are those audiences? Well, this is all kind of work in progress, so uh, some of the eagle-eyed amongst you will spot question marks that pop up every so often. But we think that the, the audiences are these, um, and this is more about um, in a kind of chronological order rather than importance. So it needs to start inside out, which means using our networks uh, and um, getting that film to as many people as possible, whether that's staff or members or supporters. Um, then we need to get grow the ripple and get the film out to other charities, communities, voluntary sectors. We need to help take the film to people in a way that works for them. So you can see from the breadth of the founding group that actually there's quite a lot of organizations there that are coming at this issue from slightly different perspectives. So how do we make sure that the film or the package around the film works for them to get the message out there? 
Uh, and then we need to identify some really key target audiences who can shift some of those barriers that I was talking about right at the beginning. So whether that's government, media, investors, donors, corporates. Um, and this is very much thinking around the model of the end of the line, which was um, the film uh, about uh, global overfishing and fish stocks, um, supported by WWF, Waitrose amongst, and Greenpeace amongst others. Um, and actually for them, uh, they thought that um, consumers would drive um, a, a call for um, supermarkets uh, and others to have a sustainable fish uh, procurement policy. Actually, as it happened, they managed to get the film to some really, really important CEOs who were in complete control of their businesses. They saw the film and said, that's it. I'm changing the policy for our fish uh, procurement. So it doesn't always kind of work out quite how you think it is, so it's really important to try and uh, identify as many of those audiences as possible. How will the film lead to action? We think roughly this, so people will watch the film and emotionally engage with that issue and be inspired to do something about it. We need to make that ask really simple, measurable, and we need to facilitate it as much as possible. And as a consequence, you end up with uh, a group of people who feel good about an issue, have managed to do something, and go on and spread the word and have become advocates for you. And how are we going to do it? What's the timeline for this? Well, um, broadly speaking, I won't read all of this out, um, we want to get the film out uh, to audiences across the summer. Uh, and then be in a position by October onwards of having a really engaged community and the beginnings of a movement that we can line up to start tackling some of these barriers. Whether we tackle those one at a time or concurrently or um, as Swarm would kind of um, recommend, I guess, you know, whether we let that, that community kind of coalesce around the, the various barriers and go with that energy, I suspect that's what we'll do. Um, is up for grabs at the moment, but broadly speaking from October, we want to be hitting them. So what are the opportunities to get involved with the Wild Network? Um, there are lots. I've pulled out four here. Um, help fund Project Wild Thing, uh, and that's helped the Green Lions team make the film the absolute best version it can possibly be. Like I said, a lot of you have been very generous in helping with the Kickstarter campaign. Right now, it's, it's about the sound, the grading, getting the right soundtrack, and all that kind of stuff. We also need money to get the film out, uh, and we need money um, to mount the campaign. So funding, really critically important. Join our advisory panel and help steer and shape this movement, because increasingly what you will see is that that founder group are literally just working to what the broader partnership wants to do. So I would really encourage you to do that. If, you, if that's not for you, join as a partner, uh, help support us, uh, and we will do everything we can to amplify what you're doing and make it bigger than the sum of the parts. Um, and hold a film screening. So help us get Project Wild Thing out there and get it discussed. So if you think you could show the film to your staff, to your supporters, to members of the public, would really like to hear from you. I really want to get a good sense of what the appetite for the film is uh, and where we're going to be able to, to get it out. Why? Why would you join the Wild Network? Because children need nature and the wild, and the nature and nature in the wild need children. Uh, it's inherent in all of us to have a childhood like that, and it's only uh, by working together that we're going to be able to shift um, and make a real social change. So please watch this space and uh, get in touch with me if you think uh, there's anything you would like to, to do. Okay, thank you.